guys, how's it going? Today's video is going to be my February wrap up. I had an amazing reading month in February. I read 13 books, loved most of them, so let's just get right into it. I started off the month with two audiobooks. The first one was Gideon the Ninth by Tanton Moyer. This is the first book in the Locked Tomb series. And the second one was the sequel to that, Harrow the Ninth. I really enjoyed both of them. Gideon the Ninth, I gave an 8.5 out of 10. Harrow the Ninth, I'm not gonna rate it yet. It's kind of complicated world building and a lot of characters with very strange names that were just kind of hard for me to pick up with my ears. <laughs> and it's written in a very unique and purposefully confusing way. And I just feel like it's one of those books that my skill level with audiobooks is not up to the level needed for this book. Before the third book comes out, I'm going to reread book two physically and I will rate it then because it's not any fault of the book that I couldn't understand to follow along. It's just purely my current skill level with audiobooks. So I didn't feel like it was fair to rate it yet. If you haven't heard about this book yet, it is frequently just described as lesbian necromancers in space. And that's, that's definitely the gist of it. It is about some sort of like kind of post-apocalyptic space world and there's different planets and there's like the emperor and the characters are from the like death and bone and tomb planet and there is a ceremony to kind of ascend to immortality and the characters go to this planet to try to do that. There's like tasks they have to do and puzzles they have to figure out. It's it's kind of weird and it's unfolded in a way that is really interesting so I don't want to spoil too much. Trigger warnings though for graphic violence, death of infants and children, and suicide. I loved the writing in this book. It was dark but had the perfect level of humor for me. It was like a dark, dry, sarcastic humor. If you don't appreciate dark humor, I don't know if this book's narration is going to work for you because that's very heavy in this book. But because that is very much my sense of humor and just the dry, witty, sarcastic humor is just perfect for me. I was laughing so many times and I don't usually laugh during books. Now even though I did laugh a lot in this book, this is not like a happy or giggly story. This is dark and violent. It is about death and necromancy and just a lot of a lot of bad. <laughs> My biggest complaint is that the names were so long and complicated and everybody had like 16 million different names and titles and nicknames. And as someone who struggles with remembering names, I found it so hard to keep track of people. Again, this might just be a me problem because I'm not good at remembering names. I'm not great at audiobooks and it just didn't quite work for me that way. But it's definitely a book that I would love to reread. I would love to own it physically. Overall though, I definitely loved both books and I am very, very excited for the third one. Next, I read books two and three of the Chrysanthemum trilogy by Morgan Cole. The second book is Empire of Jackals and the third book is Children of Jade. These are both arcs that I received from Book Sirens in exchange for an honest review. I gave book two, Empire of Jackals, a nine out of 10 and I gave book three, Children of Jade, an eight and a half out of 10. I'm not gonna go too much into the synopsis of these books because like I said, they are books two and three of a series, but essentially the trilogy is primarily about Marilia, who along with her twin brother are children of a painted lady, essentially prostitute, and they're raised in the pillow house, essentially a brothel. They're the bastard children of a high-ranking military official who dies when they are very, very young. They never knew him. I don't even know if he knew that he had children. As the daughter of a painted lady, Marilia is poor. She's the lowest of the low of society and she's a woman. So she has no opportunities and it's just kind of given that once she comes of age or a little bit earlier, she is going to become a painted lady herself. Then their mother dies very suddenly and they actually end up getting adopted by a very close friend of their father's who is basically the prefect in this like military guard type thing. Long story short, she goes on to become a very, very important figure in the military. She wins a lot of really prestigious battles. I'm not gonna go more into detail than that but her twin brother ends up resenting her quite a bit because he was supposed to be the military one. He is strong, he's very good at swordplay, he understands strategy, but he's nowhere near the level that his sister is. And it's a very interesting dynamic. I really, really enjoyed the first book and I loved this series. If you like very battle-heavy war books with a lot of strategy and a lot of slow, drawn-out campaigns, I would recommend this book. It's also quite dark and gruesome. 
Trigger warnings include rape and sexual assault, including against minors, death of children and infants, gore, graphic violence, suicide. In the second book, there is some homophobia. It's like homophobic blackmailing, animal abuse, harm to animals, and mentions of miscarriages. My favorite things about this series is something that is really minor, but I wish that every single book did it. At the starting of both books two and three, there is a section that's just called The Story So Far, and it summarizes everything that happened in the previous books. It has a, like a list of characters and a summary of events, and it is just a genius idea, and I wish that every book did that, especially a book that's this like heavy with like strategy and stuff. You kind of do need to know what's going on. I also just really liked the writing. There were a lot of lines that just really stuck out to me. Like a lot of times when I'd highlight something, I'd just like stop and think like, damn, you know? But yeah, I honestly really enjoyed my time reading this whole trilogy. I'm really interested to see other books by this author and I'm really glad that I got the chance to get these arcs and review them. The next book I read was also an arc and that was Red Hail by Jamie Killen. I gave this one an 8 out of 10. This is a story that takes place in two timelines. One of them is in the 1960s and there is essentially a plague type thing. It is suddenly raining blood, which is the red hail, and then there's this very strange illness. People start like staring off into nothing and just babbling words. There's certain like weird jerky movements. Like it's a very specific, very strange illness. And then all of a sudden it goes away. And the second timeline is present day, and it is one of the descendants of one of those people and his boyfriend who is very intrigued in the original illness and basically what it was. And all of a sudden, strange things start happening that are eerily similar to the original illness. Trigger warnings though for blood and some gore, abortion, miscarriage and birthing complications, homophobia, extreme racism, plague, implied harm against children, and religion-based violence. The 1960s timeline has a lot of racism and homophobia in it. The original community that this illness is taking place in has a pretty large Native American and Mexican population, and because some of the Mexican children were the first ones to get this illness, the white people start blaming them, they call it like the Mexican's disease. Our main character that we follow in that timeline is half Mexican, and she definitely gets a lot of that, and also because she is a young girl in the 1960s, she just has a hard time. One of our primary characters in the 1960s timeline is so amazing and badass. Her name is Dove. I'm in love with her. It's fine. Also in a present day timeline there is a male-male romance at the center of it. I also really appreciated just a small detail that one of the men is gay, the other one is bisexual, and his bisexuality was never an issue. It was never a point of conflict. It was never brought up in a negative sense. It was just a small detail that I just found very refreshing. Overall, my favorite part of this was the descriptions. It was so vivid, but not necessarily overly descriptive. This definitely stood out more in the 1960s timeline, but just everything I could picture so clearly, I could feel like I was there. Like it was just a very rich atmosphere, but it was almost like a less is more type of description. You know, we didn't have paragraphs and paragraphs explaining, you know, what everybody looked like and specific details. They would tell you just enough that you kind of get the picture in your head and then just lets your imagination run from there. One of the issues though with it being so vivid and easy to picture is that the horror elements were so creepy. Like I read this at night and that was maybe a bad decision. It's not like jump scares or like ghosts or anything. It's just eerie and uncomfortable. Like animals just acting wrong. Like there's one scene that all of the birds start chirping in sync with each other and you just can picture it and it's just not right. You know like it's one of those things that it's just mm, it just makes you feel a little bit weird. My main complaint with this book is that the mystery aspect it was just kind of missing something for me. I feel like he didn't get enough clues or even like false clues or red herrings. Like there just wasn't enough for me to try to solve the mystery. One of my favorite things about reading a specific mystery novel is trying to solve the mystery along with the characters, is playing detective. Even if I'm completely wrong, I want to at least be able to make a couple guesses. And I felt like this one, like halfway through the book, I still had no guesses just because we didn't have enough details. And I wish that even if there would have been like a couple other clues, even if they were completely like false leads, I just wanted something. 
If you're the kind of reader that doesn't really care about solving the mystery yourself or if you're just along for the ride or if you don't mind just watching the characters solve the mystery, I definitely don't think that would be a problem. This book was super well written but just for my personal taste in mysteries, I was kind of bummed out by that. Overall though, like I said, I am still thinking about this book a month later. It is still so vivid in my mind. There are so many things that I just absolutely loved. I'm definitely going to check out other works by this author and like I said, I gave it an 8 out of 10. Next, I finally read a physical book and that was Watch Us Rise by Renee Watson and Ellen Hagen. I gave this an 8.5 out of 10. This is the story of a group of friends who are artivists. So they're like activists and really into art. They go to this like social justice based high school. I don't know if that's a real thing, like high schools that just specialize in one thing. They're in the States. I think they're in, yeah, they're in New York. So it was a little bit weird, but I'm just going to go with it. But basically they are in the school that really promotes being socially and politically aware. And they both kind of realize that there's not enough feminism in what they're learning and what their clubs are. So they decide to make their own feminism club. Trick warnings in this one include racism, fat phobia, and death of a parent, specifically through cancer. I really liked this. I feel like this had so many great discussions. As someone that doesn't usually enjoy reading a teenage perspectives or being able to really relate with teenagers, a lot of times I have trouble with specifically YA contemporaries, but this one I just thought did an amazing job and I really was able to connect with the characters and the message and the story. Like I was saying, this book definitely tackles a lot of like social justice issues, specifically feminism and racism and fat phobia and just how all of those intersect. And I really thought this had so many great discussions. One of my favorite things is the main characters make a lot of mistakes. They go too far sometimes. They do some things that are actually not okay and even though their intentions are good, they mess up and I think that that's very important because you know you don't just decide I hate racism and suddenly you're a perfect anti-racist ally. Like nah, it doesn't work that way. As humans we're always learning and growing and you're gonna fuck up and that's okay as long as you are learning from those mistakes and not making those mistakes again and are working to better yourself it's okay. Like a couple of examples, one of the main characters, when one of the teachers says that she has to go home and make supper, she makes a remark about how, you know, that isn't very feminist that she has to go home and cook for her husband and why doesn't he cook for her and blah blah blah. And the teacher, you know, calmly explains, well actually I enjoy cooking, I get home first so I cook the supper, also I'm married to a woman. And it's just one of those things that the characters sometimes do take it too far and sometimes they mess up. I feel like this book allowed characters to be wrong without being malicious and without being vilified. It's not just villains that make racist remarks. A lot of well-intentioned people that just don't know any better or people don't realize that they're doing something wrong. I will say the plot of this book was really weak but it's not really necessarily a book that you read for the plot. You read for the characters and you read for the messages. If you're someone who needs a strong plot to carry you through a book, Definitely keep that in mind when you're reading this, but honestly, I didn't find it too bad. I found it pretty easy to follow. I will say that I know that most people that are picking up this book already agree with a lot of these messages, but I do think that it presents them in a way and it says enough other things that there's still some good things to learn about this. I think that it has a lot of nuance that I really liked. So overall, definitely a great book and I would recommend it. Next, I again have books two and three of a series, and that is A Heart So Fierce and Broken and A Vow So Bold and Deadly. These are books two and three of the Curse Breaker series by Bridget Kemmermer, the first book being A Curse So Dark and Lonely. Book two I gave a nine out of ten, and book three I gave an eight and a half out of ten. I'm not going to be going into the synopsis itself because spoilers. The first book is a Beauty and the Beast retelling, but by the time we're in the second book, it's taken on its own thing and it's very much its own story. I also buddy read both of these books with my friend Audrey, who I'm going to leave linked down below. We read the first book together and then decided to read the second book and then towards the end of that one it just seemed like there was going to be so much that needed to happen in the third book so we agreed that we both really wanted to read it so we ordered the third book and then immediately read that one together. I know that one of the reasons why I had so much fun with these books were because of the buddy reading experience. Like looking back on especially some things in the second book there was a main romance subplot that I just did not care about. I just found it really unnecessary but because I was buddy reading it and venting along with Audrey as we went it really didn't bother me that much. I feel like if I was reading this on my own I would get very annoyed and impatient but because I was reading it along with a friend and was able to vent and complain and make jokes the whole way it didn't bother me nearly as much as it would have. I also really loved that not to give anything away but 
we start the second book basically with two opposing sides. And I really loved that both sides made sense. They both had very difficult decisions. You could clearly see why they thought each way. And they were both right and both wrong at the same time. And I think that a lot of times, some of them they kind of play into this character's the good guy and this character's the bad guy. But they weren't. They were just both doing what they thought was right and both messing up. <laughs> as far as the third book goes, I really enjoyed it. But the ending seemed really rushed. I did like the final battle. I thought it was very intense. But I thought that it ended very quickly. I feel like I liked a lot of the solutions, we just came about them too quickly. Like I just wish it would have maybe slowed down the pacing a little bit, kind of explored more things, seen more of the battle, things like that. So I definitely really enjoyed it. It wasn't the strongest ending, but I still had a ton of fun with this series. Then I read another audiobook and that was A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. I gave this a 7.5 out of 10. In this story, a handful of years ago, there was a girl, a high school student, that was murdered. They don't know what happened, they never found her body. And then while they were investigating the case, her boyfriend, who was clearly one of the suspects, kills himself. And the case is closed, they blame the boyfriend, they figure it's kind of obvious, and they just carry on from there. Fast forward to present day, and for one of our main characters, like, final projects, she wants to study that case and see if that's really what happened. Because she knew the boyfriend from when she was a kid, and she thought that he was a nice person, she just couldn't see him being a murderer. So she decides to investigate the case with the help of his brother and etc, etc. Trigger warnings for suicide, implied domestic abuse, racism, and there is harm that comes to a dog. And I was really mad about it. I won't say anything more because spoilers, but if you want to know the specifics, message me and I'll let you know. One thing that I really enjoyed was the mystery aspect. There was a lot of suspects and you could kind of see a case for each one. Like I was saying earlier, I really like playing detective along with the characters. I really like trying to solve the mystery and looking for clues. I just find that really fun. So this book definitely kept me guessing. I will say that the friendship and relationship between the main character and the alleged murderer's brother was really quick, really rushed. They are around the same age. I think they had like seen each other around at school, but they didn't really know each other beforehand. But they just get very close, very quick. He trusts her right away. She trusts him right away. And it's just... I don't know, it feels really rushed to me. This family is very distrustful of the town because people are just always terrible to them. Like, even when they go out shopping, people won't look at them. Cashiers are mean to them. Like, at one point, the brother is trying to pay for something and the cashier won't, like, touch his money because, you know, she acts like it's dirty or contaminated or something. Like, this family is just treated terribly. And for him to go from dealing with that to all of a sudden... A girl shows up on his doorstep saying she wants to look into his brother's murder and she, he just goes along with her and just hangs out with her all the time. They explain it because he also wants to prove his brother's innocence, but it just seems a little bit unbelievable. It's just a little bit too trusting. Overall though, even though I wasn't in love with the characters, I did really like the plot and I really liked the mystery and overall I enjoyed the book. The next book I read is one that I felt a lot of pressure with and that was Middle Game by Shauna McGuire. If you watched my February TBR video, this one I picked as a five-star prediction. So I felt a little bit worried going into it, but luckily I gave it, I think, a 9 out of 10, which does round up to a 5 out of 5. So luckily, I loved this. It's about twins, Roger and Dodger, who are basically experiments. They are separated at birth and sent to live with families. They have certain powers that they don't necessarily know about. There's also like an evil genius kind of situation going, and he is trying to take over the world and... The magic system is alchemy, and I don't know if it's just me, but alchemy is something that I have such a hard time wrapping my brain around. I know what it is, I understand the basics, and I can kind of follow along, but as soon as it's introduced into a story, and this is any time it's in a story, like, I just have such a hard time making it compute in my head. But essentially the twins are supposed to have the super high power and be able to control the world, and that's, that's the story. <laughs> Trigger warnings for blood, gore, torture, human experimentation, including against children and babies, self-harm, and suicide. I loved the writing style for this. I just really love the way that everything is described. It's just beautiful writing. It is quite dark though. There is a lot of violence, a lot of murder, a lot of just senseless violence. I enjoyed that part, but it definitely gets kind of heavy-handed at times. The evil characters are very evil and a couple of them are just evil for the sake of evil, like very kind of cheesy villainish, but not cheesy because they're scary. <laughs> this is also one of those books that is 
very strange, very confusing, but you just gotta go along with it. If you're the kind of reader that has to understand everything every step of the way, <sighs> good luck. <laughs> like I was saying, the magic system is strange and kind of vague. It's not gonna get explained 100%. You're not gonna understand it 100%. There's also some, like, time travel-y, paradox-y type things going on, which I love, but it doesn't always make sense because you don't get enough information. And that's okay. For this book, you just gotta go along for the ride and you will have a great time. The main reason why I rated it a 9 out of 10 and not a 10 out of 10 is because the ending, it was almost too confusing or almost too quick or too slow. There was just something off about the ending that I just didn't 100% get into. I feel like some of the solutions were a little bit too weird for me. So I really loved the story. I really loved the ride it took. I really loved the characters, their relationship. I loved the magic and the writing. But it was just because of that ending and just the disconnect that I felt. I couldn't quite rate it a 10 out of 10. But on Goodreads, a 9 out of 10 is still a 5 out of 5. So mission accomplished. The next book I read was a reread and that was Autobiography of a Face by Lucy Greeley. This is a memoir by Lucy Greeley who was a poet. When she was nine years old she had cancer and they had to remove about half of her jaw. And this is the story of her life and being in and out of the hospital and just being constantly perceived as ugly by the outside world because her face was misshapen and it was just a very dark look at her life. Trigger warnings for cancer, terminally ill children, depression, self-harm, brief drug abuse, and lots of talk of ugliness. She refers to herself as ugly all the time throughout the story. I ended up reading this an 8 out of 10. As a book, it definitely had a lot of tangents and the timeline was kind of all over the place and jumping around a lot. As someone who also speaks in tangents constantly and takes a really winding path to get to my point, I can relate but as a reading experience it was a little bit hard to follow at times. One of the things that I loved is that she doesn't change the story to make the reader more comfortable. You know she doesn't try to have this underlying message of hope and happiness like she's depressed and she feels ugly and worthless and unlovable and she lets you know that and I really respect that. There's also sometimes that are hard to read because she didn't know what was happening and there's actually one part that years later they refer to something and they said oh it was before Lucy had cancer. She's like wait I, I had cancer? I'm like uh yeah what, what did you think you had? She's like well, I thought it was you know the long complicated you know the official scientific name of her specific cancer and they're like yes that's cancer and just how clueless she was and how when she went in for you know her chemo and everything and when they were telling her she might lose her hair she just kind of made a joke about how her hair might turn purple like she was just so clueless and innocent and so many times they didn't sit down to explain it to her because it was almost like they tried to preserve her innocence but you can't keep a child clueless when they're going through that and it was really difficult to read at times. Another thing that I really liked is that basically her first couple surgeries were to save her life, were to reconstruct her jaw so that she could eat properly and not be in as much pain but after that she spent the rest of her life having surgeries just so that she could fit in with the world so she would have a normal face and it's heartbreaking that she and the doctors felt this was necessary and it's also heartbreaking because they didn't work. Every single surgery fails in the end and at the end she doesn't find love, she's not fully happy, she does not have the face she always wanted. I really like that this book doesn't have a happy ending because her life didn't have a happy ending. Also this isn't in the book because it happened after she died. She died in 2002 when she was 39 years old. She died of an accidental heroin overdose. She's been essentially on prescription painkillers since she was a child and she has been in so much physical pain her entire life. She has had constant surgeries. Pain medication only works for so long until your body starts getting resistant to it and until oftentimes you get addicted to it and her addiction escalated and escalated until it became a heroin addiction and she died of an accidental overdose. A lot of times when there's mention of Lucy Greeley they don't mention like her poetry or her life or all of the things that she's done. They just talk about how she had a disfigured face and she died of a drug addiction and that just makes me so mad. So knowing that and having that in the back of my mind while I'm reading this book just makes it all the more impactful and there's so many times that 
things get mentioned and because, you know, I'm in the future and I know how she dies and I know how the rest of her life goes, so much of this is even harder to read. So yes, overall, as a reading experience, I absolutely adored this book and I am so glad that I ended up rereading it. The next book I read was Wonderland by Juno Dawson and I gave this a 9.5 out of 10. This is the story of a girl named Alice whose friend Bunny goes missing and she ends up seeing that she was invited to this really exclusive kind of trippy party called Wonderland. So she ends up getting into this party to look for her friend. And if you haven't caught on yet, this book is full of Alice in Wonderland references. It's very overdone, but it's, it's really fun. It's so fun looking for all of the different references and little things like that. Even in the characters' names and certain things. Like, the first time when she meets Bunny, she is running late for something. Like, I don't know, it's just one of those things that if you really like Alice in Wonderland, I think this book is going to be a lot of fun. I will say though, trigger warnings for fetishizing trans people, suicide and suicidal thoughts, self-harm, being drugged and attempted sexual assault, overdosing, and dead naming. I do want to touch on the fetishizing trans people real quick. So our main character is trans, the author is also trans, it is own voices in that way, and the main character experiences a lot of instances of people that just want to be with her because she's trans. The book doesn't glorify that, but it is part of her experience. Overall though, this book was so much fun. This was trippy and weird and it was really hard to tell what was reality and what wasn't. Also the main character has depression and takes medication for it and she has some other type of mental illness that they never actually specify but she has trouble discerning reality and sometimes sees things that aren't there and of course when she goes to the party she doesn't bring her medication so you have kind of that trippy element and again because there's so many references to Alice in Wonderland it's trippy. This is definitely a book that you shouldn't question. Just just go along for the ride. There is some things in here that are definitely over the top and unbelievable. The characters in this, all the other characters, are very rich and they can get away with a lot of crazy things. But again, you just gotta go with it and just accept it and it's gonna be so much fun. This book also has a lot of easter eggs for Juno you know, since two previous books, Clean and Meat Market. There is minor spoilers for Clean, but I don't think it will affect the enjoyment of Clean at all, unless you're the person that really hates any type of spoilers. It doesn't really matter what order you read them in, but one of the like subplots in this is also mentioned in a subplot of Clean. In Clean, you're following a rich socialite who is in a rehab facility, and a lot of times she's talking about something that happened to her best friend who is no longer with them. And by the context, it's really obvious what happened, so it's not a surprise, and in this book they talk about what had happened. So unless you don't want any, any spoilers at all, it's really not a big deal. I've said this before and I'll say it again, Juno Dawson is really good at writing dark, ugly worlds, and this is a very different vibe, I think, from Clean and Meat Market. Those ones were more, like, gritty dark, this one is more, like, twisted dark. And it's really fun. I really like that kind of vibe. I think that it explores a lot of cool topics and there's so many things that Juno Dawson does that just... Not like in a preachy or like soapbox way, just in little like throwaway little lines and nuggets that just kind of get it and make you think. And I just adore that. So overall, if you like Juno Dawson's writing style, if you like Alice in Wonderland, if you like weird or trippy books, I would definitely, definitely recommend this. I had so much fun reading it. And yeah, definitely a 9.5 out of 10 for me. And finally last, but definitely not least, is We Have Always Been Here by Samra Habib. I gave this one a 9 out of 10. This is, as it says on the side here, a queer Muslim memoir. This is the story of the author's life. It's a memoir. And how she is a queer Muslim woman. She immigrates to Canada when she is quite young. And how just her experiences have been as somebody who is very involved in the Muslim faith and who grew up in a Muslim household and in a society that doesn't accept queer people, especially queer women, and just how she ends up kind of finding herself and discovering who she is and coming to terms with that. Trigger warnings for homophobia, attempted suicide, and references to abusive relationships. There's no on-the-page abuse, but they reference other relationships and just basically things that have happened. This book was so well-written. I really loved the way that the author 
writes. She's also a photographer and she had a photography project that she was working on that I looked up after the book because I was just so intrigued by it. And she basically photographs queer people of color, a lot of times specifically Muslims, and basically just to prove that they exist. It's a perspective that I know that I haven't heard enough and I think that a lot of people haven't heard enough because a lot of people in the queer Muslim community can't speak about it. And with her photography project, a lot of times when she's talking about people that still like live in Middle Eastern countries specifically, especially countries that it's still illegal to be gay, you know, they want to have their picture taken but they won't be able to show their face or she has to have them like turned around or something like that. Like they can't be identified in any way because they're still so terrified for their life. And the book is not only her experience but her trying to raise these voices of people that exist but can't come out and are overlooked even when they do. And it's just a very good perspective and it just really makes me think and it was so so well written. She's a photographer but just in the way that she writes, the way that she describes things, you can tell that she sees the world in such an artistic way. Like I just feel like sometimes with artistic people they just have a way of speaking, of seeing the world, of describing things that you can just tell that they're artists and she's definitely such an artist. I would highly recommend it. Like I said, it's not a voice that I hear spoken about very often, so I would definitely recommend checking out this book. And there we have it. Those are the 13 books that I read in the month of February. I feel like this video was a million hours long, so I'm sorry. If you're still here though, let me know. Comment an airplane down below. Either an airplane emoji or just the word airplane. Honestly, that's one of my favorite things in videos and I've been wanting to do it for a while. But when like at the end of the video, like the person tells you like a word or an emoji or something to comment, I just, I don't know, it's such a fun game. And I always have so much fun with that. So I think I might kind of start doing that. So for today, airplane. <laughs> Aside from airplanes, let me know if you read any of these books and if you have any thoughts, if there's anything you agreed with or disagreed with, any other books that you read in February that you want to talk about. In the meantime though, that is all for today's video. If you guys enjoyed it, please click the like button to let me know and subscribe to stay up to date for the rest of my videos. I try to post videos every Wednesday and Sunday, usually reading or writing related. So I hope to see you guys next time and until then, have a great day. Bye!